All right, uh, Pam Lewison is our Center for Agriculture Director. We're going to get an update on ag policy and what's happening in the legislature now. Pam, um, as always, great to see you. I know the overtime rules have been very big uh, and front and center in your world. Uh, tell us about the latest on that. Uh, so Ag Overtime got a hearing last week uh, in the Senate Labor Committee, and uh, it went about as well as you would expect, which is not great. Um, it was it was basically mentioned that, that the hearing was a, a legislative courtesy to um, the prime sponsor of the bill, which is Senator Curtis King. Uh, I think the the interesting thing about it is that it was, as we uh, in agriculture face uh, the 40 hour a week threshold that began January 1st, uh, people are, I think, very concerned about how they're going to be able to get things harvested and take care of their employees at the same time. Uh, and that was shared um, very specifically through testimony uh, by an orchardist uh, from the Chelan area, her name's April Clayton. She testified that her family um, just a few months ago had um, decided to close their farm uh, specifically because they couldn't afford uh, to continue to pay overtime. And so we're sort of seeing the rollout of unintended consequences to this, uh, to this law. Specifically in their case, um, they had several longtime employees who were housed at no expense um, on the farm. Uh, in the event that they have to sell the farm, uh, those employees will be displaced. They'll have to pay rent and utilities and um, things like that for the first time ever uh, in their sort of working lives. And so um, that's one of the things that people don't think about when they think about small farms and, and how they operate um, in the environment that we're in. Yeah, I remember last year there was a hearing where one of the representatives, it was uh, people were speaking Spanish and one of the representatives um, spoke on their behalf, you know, the, like reinterpreted things for them, which I, you know, it still blows me away that that's allowed at all, uh, particularly if you're changing what, what the people are saying. Uh, and the emphasis of what they're saying. Um, but it showed a, um, I, I thought it showed an egotism about, you know, how we who have nothing to do with agriculture know best how to deal with agriculture. And for those of you who, you know, showed up here, don't you worry, you're going to love what we do, even if you're here to oppose it, um, which is a, kind of a strange, uh, strange thing. Um, as the how many people showed up to this hearing? It was I mean, was it well attended on the agriculture side for for that kind of policy or um, it, it was just... well attended on both sides. Um, both uh, both sides of the argument were allowed to have four people testify. And um, you know there were there were also farm workers who were in favor of this bill that would um, the bill is Senate bill fifty four seventy six. What it does is give farmers twelve weeks during harvest where their um, overtime threshold is increased from the current 40 hour uh, threshold up to 50 hours and just for 12 weeks during the course of the year. So not forever, um, but just to help get them through harvest and provide a little bit of relief in that, um, in that overtime discussion. And um, so there were for and against and there were farm workers who were for and against it too. So I think we're starting to see um, that discussion shift a little bit so that it's not so much farmers themselves as it is farm workers saying, hey, this is really impacting my bottom line. Um, I was told that I would be able to spend more time with my family, but what is actually happening is now I have to have two jobs where I used to only have to have one. And so um, to put that in a little bit of perspective, uh, anecdotally, what we've been told is that in 2023, during the fruit picking season, um, farmers were paying about $23 an hour to have fruit handpicked uh, throughout the state. What that equates to in overtime wages is $32.50 an hour. Now, if you look at um, Mrs. Clayton's testimony, what she noted was their 900 pound harvest of gala apples on an organic side of their farm paid $87.
which means that they have paid one worker for two hours of overtime, and that is it. That doesn't include things like property taxes and pesticides and anyone else who works there and those rents and utilities and other things that they help cover for their employees. And their primary concern, uh, as far as her testimony was concerned, was those farm workers. Where are they going to go and what are they going to do? Because they've now been displaced by a law that, that this small farm has to abide by when they can't afford it. Well, and the, the, I mean, the blunt reality, I think, is that if you're if you can't make any money off that farm, it will close or it will change what it's doing and it will not something's going, going to give and it's not going to remain the same. They're not going to pay people just just to break even barely, even if they break even barely because the risk is too high. So something's going to change there. And, and the, the people that will be hurt the fastest are those who were picking that that group at that time. So. I think uh, cherries is the best example of it, honestly. Last year, the cherry uh, harvest season was truncated quite a bit because of the weather we had. And so um, we, you know, we as a state are very proud of our sweet cherries. It's, it's a big deal here when cherry harvest hits. The thing to think about in terms of what this looks like long term is that potentially farms are going to say last year's cherry harvest was short, not great. And because everyone's cherries were on the market at the same time, they didn't pay very well. So do we keep cherries or do we go to something that is less labor intensive and has a better, more guaranteed rate of return? All of us, uh, this is from Heidi. All of a sudden, I'm hearing about migrants from the border in the region getting paid for housing. Is there a count on this? I have no idea. <laughs> um, to be honest, I think uh, we have so many other things to deal with in terms of what we're looking at with farm workers, uh, people who come here to work on a visa um, through the H2A program, which I think we'll talk about in a little bit, um, that it is something that is. If we're not dealing with it in the legislature right now, uh, it's I'm just not looking into it, to be honest. Well, you're muted, Dave. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, Christine writes, uh, she fears the reason for the overtime rule is to force farmers out of business. Um, <laughs> you know, that's an understandable concern. Uh, whether people want it or not, uh, you know, I mean, there's a big story uh, in the paper uh, yesterday or the day before about Minnesota farmers uh, packing up and how many small Minnesota family farms have closed up shop. And um, and these are the kind of things that, that will impact Washington as well. I think there's, uh, you know, I think it's a legitimate fear, but I also think that it isn't so much about trying to force farmers out of business as it is about having a fundamental misunderstanding about how farms operate. And we've talked about that a lot, you know, that Farms um, are not able to absorb these kinds of costs because uh, any increase in cost isn't reflected in what we get paid. We can only get paid what the market will allow. And often those market allowance contracts are negotiated in advance. So uh, if you are, for example, a potato farmer, you are likely in meetings discussing your potato contract for the year as early as February or March. You haven't even put seed in the ground and you are agreeing to a price for the end of the year when you will harvest those potatoes in September or October. So um, you're having to get your crystal ball out a little bit and figure out what you think your labor costs will be, what you believe your other inputs will be in terms of fertilizer, fumigant, et cetera, and hope that what you have in that contract matches up with the costs for those potato fields. Um, and that is where the misunderstanding is. If, if a manufacturer suddenly has to pay overtime, for example, um, they are able to say, well, we have an additional cost. Now we have to raise the price of our product. Farms can't do that. We as farm owners do not negotiate based on what our total input costs are. If we did, 
uh, food would be extraordinarily expensive because it's expensive to produce it. What's the um, what's the status of the H two A program? That's one thing that you've written about extensively. I know you've uh, you've pointed out that um, it's essential to Washington's agriculture, and you've gone through step by step about you know cause, because people have um, on this show uh, on, uh, people have expressed concerns are you know uh, are we undermining local work? And you've pointed out no, you know, and for various reasons you've you've laid that out, and you've laid out a case about how essential it is to Washington's agricultural community. And yet, uh, there's new regulations proposed on uh, that would add a burden to those who are already involved in the H-2A program. And let me just start uh, by saying, I recall, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but farmers that are seeking to get into the H-2A program are out 30 grand just at the start. Am I right about that? Uh, plus close to that? We, you figure it out to be about $1,500 an employee. Uh, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's a weird dynamic with H-2A. I think a lot of people don't understand how the program works. And so they assume that it's taking from um, local people who are here. Uh, so the, the quick refresher for um, people who've tuned in lots of times, um, the way H-2A works is you have to advertise for a minimum of 60 days ahead of your first date of hire and uh, effectively prove to the U.S. Department of Labor that there is a labor shortage in your area, as in there are no people who are able-bodied, able have the ability or the desire to work for you. Uh, if that is the case, if you're able to make your case, what you can do then is apply for H-2A workers. Now, the thing to understand about that is for 50% of that contract, so however long they're here, if they are here for six months or three months after your H-2A workers arrive, you have to give preference to local hires. So if you have 50 H-2A workers and 50 people from town show up at some point during that first three months, you must sit your H-2A workers out and hire the local 50 people while still paying the 50 H-2A workers. Because if you don't pay them, they go home. That's so crazy. Yeah. Um, the other part of that is if you are an H-2A employer, you are providing housing, transportation, all medical and dental services, everything that that person needs for their general life maintenance, you provide to them while they are here with the exception of buying them groceries. So um, there's a lot of talk about H2A having a negative impact on the local environment in terms of farm workers themselves. In fact, House Bill 2226 and its companion in the Senate, 5996, deal with it very specifically. They have laid out in this bill what they want uh, is a prevailing wage survey that is done to farm workers. So right now, there's a prevailing wage survey that is voluntary, um, that is administered to employers. How much, you know, how much are you paying? Uh, how many H-2A workers do you have? And a list of other demographic questions. Um, advocates want to also have a similar piece of legislation, or excuse me, this piece of legislation tracking farm workers answering the exact same questions with a couple of extra caveats. There's a very specific set number for um, the employers, or excuse me, the employees who are to be surveyed. And every answerer of that survey is supposed to receive a $25 incentive for their time. So right off the top, you have, you have about a $70,000 investment just for the incentive payments alone. That doesn't include the cost of paying for uh, the people who will administer those surveys and any of the data collection um, and sifting through of that data that goes on afterward. So who, who pays the $25? 
Would that be taxpayers uh, or would it be? You, me, and everybody else who lives in this okay. city pays taxes. Um, so um, right off the top, there are some problems with it. The other uh, comment that goes along with this sort of inherently is um, advocates say that H-2A brings wages down. Now, if you know anything about the H-2A program, it is intended to be cost prohibitive on purpose. And part of that cost prohibitive nature is the adverse effect wage rate, which is effectively the minimum wage that you can pay an H-2A worker. In Washington state for this year, it's $19.25 an hour. That is the least amount of money that you can pay not only an H-2A worker, but any local employee working alongside that H-2A worker doing the same job. So while we have um, an anecdotal wage of about $23.50, what is causing that wage to increase so far is that minimum threshold of the 1925 because no one is going to show up for the state minimum wage of $16 if they can go somewhere else and earn $3 more just because there is someone there that has a visa. So what we have seen in ag is that um, wages are actually artificially increased pretty significantly rather than what the bill argues or bills argue, which is that they are depressed. On average, how many H-2A workers are employed in our state each year? Last year, we were at about 35,000. This year, we were at 38,000 um, certified workers. So those are folks that will um, begin arriving anytime. What's, what's the status of the proposed changes to the H-2A program? I mean, do you see these being fast-tracked? Do you see potential for, you know, was, common sense? It was referred to, I believe, Ways and Means. So I think they have, uh, as I recall, until the end of the week to um, move it out of its house of origin. So um, the hearing was done in the House, so we may very well see it in the Senate. I think the real um, concern I have with it is, you know, aside from the use of taxpayer dollars, um, the wage survey has absolutely zero effect on federal policy. So even though the state conducts this survey uh, with employers currently, even if we added in this additional expense, effectively doubling the cost of this annual wage survey, it still does nothing to change federal H-2A policy. It doesn't even guide how the, how, the adverse effect wage rate is calculated. Are there any other areas of ag policy that uh, that you're tracking that you think people need to know about right now? There are a ton of water bills. Um, I'm not going to rattle off the numbers. Uh, I think the thing to remember about water uh, in Washington is that we have sort of a feast or famine, depending on where you are. And um, more specifically, when you look at how water is governed in our state, it is, as with all states in the West, it is still a little bit of um, a wild West situation. So um, it's nice to see water being discussed in terms of making sure that everybody has it available to them. Um, but I do think that we also need to understand uh, it's a finite resource and um, we need to be careful about how we talk about it because we have so many different water systems in the state. Some of them are governed specifically by Washington. Some of them are federal governance. Some of them are a blend of the two. Um, so we need to make sure that we are um, including as much specificity as possible in all of our water legislation. Well, look, uh, for everybody watching, if you want to explain the H-2A program to anybody, I, I put in our handy explainer video in, uh, in the link section. Go to the chat section, grab that link, and you can, it's a little animated feature we, we uh, created a while back to explain the H-2A program to people. So next time you have an argument, you don't even have to remember all the details. You just grab that link and say, watch this animated feature for less than two minutes, and you'll get all the education you, you need to have to continue this discussion.
And then you can self-righteously just say, I'm not even continuing this discussion until you're done watching this video. So there, because <laughs> obviously you're ignorant um, and have, have some great fun with that. Anyway, Pam, uh, thanks so much for uh, uh, updating us on the ag portion of our state. Uh, just, just for those of us who forget, ag is our, what, number three economic engine in the state. Number two? I thought it shifted back and forth. Well, it's probably shifted from aerospace. <laughs> you know, it, it moves uh, back and forth. But yeah, number, but two number two or number three, depending on the year, we're number two uh, for economic engines in the state. And so agriculture is no small. I mean, we're known for Microsoft. We're known for the big high tech stuff. But uh, ag is a big economic driver in the state. And it's important not to forget that and forget that perspective, even though it's just a fraction of the people um, involved in the actual creation and, and the farming aspect of it. So important for Washington State. Thanks so much, Pam. And thank you for watching here, Washington Policy on the Go. We'll be back next week. I'm shooting for a starting time of 12.15, but uh, if we can't get Zoom to reflect that, we'll probably uh, change the calendar to 12.30 starts. So watch for that. I'm not saying it's going to happen next week, but it's going to happen soon so that we can avoid any, any late starts or anything like that. Thanks a lot for joining us here at Washington Policy Center, and be sure to check out WashingtonPolicy.org every day for the latest on the legislative session. Thank you.